to welcome everyone to this episode of The Pulse. And we're excited about our guest today for a lot of reasons. You know, I'm a Philly guy, Philly sports fan, and he is longtime associated with our champion Eagles. I'm never going to stop calling them champions. But he's he's more than that. Longtime Eagle, performer, magician. Uh, they're making a, a, a movie about his life. Uh, he's touring around, and he's got a tremendous story. So we are joined on The Pulse today by John Doran Boss. Welcome, sir. Yes, baby, yes. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. And as a longtime Eagles fan, my first response was, so the first Eagle we're going to have on is the long snapper? That means right now that we are trendsetters, baby. Come on, <laughs> we're setting up. I'm going to... I'm going to pave the way for the rest of the guys. We do a lot of research when we're about to talk to people. And so I knew of Long Snapper. I knew of Magician. I knew of all your talent. I didn't know as much about all of your story. You know, so if we can share some of that, let's, let's start how you kind of got into this. Because you're, there were challenges even as you were young as developing John Dorenbaugh. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, life, life is... Uh, what we go through, how we experience it, is make it makes us who we are. And so, um, when I was 12 years old, uh, I lived in a Brady Bunch family. My dad was my hero. Uh, played catch with him every day. Coached my teams. President of little league. My mom was a hero for for many different reasons. She volunteered at the school. I'm not going to say I had a learning disability, but learning for me has always been really hard. In my reading comprehension, I've always struggled. So, my mom volunteered at the school, and the reading program created like this a different way to learn and all the cool kids like my mom. So guess what? All the cool kids started to like me as I got older. And so, you know, my dad kind of being the president and, and the man of the house and showing me what it's like to be a man. And then my mom showing me that you can be different. You don't have to be good at everything like everybody else, but you still have a purpose, a place, and you can still be wanted and contribute. Mm -hmm. And so both, both were, were huge influences in my life. Uh, and then when I was 12 years old, I came home and discovered that my father had murdered my mother out of absolutely nowhere. I, I go back to that, and I, I guess I apologize for starting there, but I think that it's important because that was an early start for a young man, and yet you kind of became you. Like, was that the foundation right there to start shaping the strength, the personality, the person that you became later? That was a, a pretty significant event at, a, at an age to where you are – young enough to completely understand and grasp the severity of the situation, but also young enough, or I should say old enough to understand it, and young enough to still be influenced in a positive way, that your life can still go up or down, right? And so, you know, my grandparents who helped raise me, my aunt who ended up getting custody of me on my mom's side helped raise me. And then I went through eight months to a year of the most intense therapy you could possibly imagine during that time. And that right there is what I think I owe ultimately what I'm most proud of in my life. And that's just my happiness. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to be alive. I'm happy to, to be in this world and I'm happy to continue to, to try and do things. So John Dornbos, the strong person and personality started there, but right around that time, around that age, that's when you also started with magic or performing or when that's kind of started happening for you too. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Wow. Bad timing. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. That's when, <clears throat> excuse me. Gosh, you know what? <clears throat> Hold on. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. I was actually 12, 13 years old, uh, and I had moved down to Southern California, and then I went back to Woodenville, Washington, where I was living, and I stayed with a baseball coach. I made the Little League All-Star team, so I traveled back to, to play in that tournament. And when I was staying with the coach, his son was friends with a kid who was a magician. So that kid came over uh, and did like a 30-minute show, and it was amazing. And then he took me to a magic shop. His name was Michael Groves. He bought me a, a, a book and a, and a trick. And I just practiced it. Here's what I figured out. That for me, magic was never about performing when I was that age. Mm -hmm. To me, when I would sit down and shuffle cards or I would do a trick, it was the only time the world quieted. It was the only time I didn't think about my dad going to prison, losing both my parents, you know, kind of selling everything right and going into a temporary foster home for eight months, nine months, 10 months, whatever it was, moving down and in, in with my aunt and just having a complete life-changing uh, year. I would sit down, I would hear the cards riffle, I would shuffle, and the world quieted, and that was my time to be a kid. That talent kind of coming out was, was almost therapy for you. It, it took my mind away and it taught me that something can be very, very difficult, but if I just keep working on it and just keep practicing over time with discipline, right? You're gonna get good at it. So John Dornbos, the performer actually happened before John Dornbos, the football player. When I got into junior high, my nickname was Ogre. So I was like the six foot, 200 pound kid. Then I went into my freshman year in high school 
And I was still a pretty big kid for high school. And my buddy, Kevin Johansson said, Hey, you should play football. And I was like, no way, dude. Football's for dorks. I like magic. Right. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, right. Things. And I'll, I'll, yeah. Right. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, you can hit that guy and not get in trouble. <laughs> well, that actually sounds pretty cool. Like I didn't really understand the game. I just knew go get the ball, go hit the guy with the ball. Don't get in trouble. So think about this. I had the perfect combination. I had a lot of, a lot of, uh, you can say anger, resentment, betrayal, all these feelings that kind of harbor up just negative emotion, right? That I just needed to get out somehow, some way that I had accumulated over the last couple of years. So now I could hit you during the day, not get in trouble, get out my aggression. And then I would go home at night. I would light a candle. Yes, I would listen to Yanni track number nine, Felista on repeat, okay? And then I would just shuffle. And I kind of had this balance of being like a gladiator during the day and then kind of just chill Zen guy at night with cards. Welcome back to The Pulse. Spending some time with former professional football player, performer, motivational speaker, John Dorenboss. Let's get right back to the discussion. So you just kept getting better at football, kept getting better at magic as well. Um, you played through high school, you played into college, correct? And yeah. we're, we're pretty good at various positions, not long snapper. Uh, didn't have any offers, no scholarships. And so I went to Golden West Junior College, who at the time was 0-30, which means they didn't win a game for three years. 0-10, 0-10, 0-10. So John Dornboss went to Golden West Junior College, and boom, you nailed it. We lost another 10. So we went 0-40, uh, but then that's kind of where the whole journey started, and my life kind of took off because I knew Golden West was going to be a stepping stone. Right. So I was like, hey, if I, if I can't play there, then I can't play anywhere. Go somewhere where you're going to get on the field. You know, a coach of mine in high school and my, my friend's dad, Bill Simpson, was a safety for 10, I don't know, 10, 12 years in the NFL for the Rams back in the day. And I always remember him saying, go where you can play, get on the field, and you'll be seen. So your team was 0-40. And, and then at some point, what was it, a friend who said, hey, you want to be a long snapper? Like, you had not done this before, and you duped them into giving you a chance. My best friend, Paul Tessier, who I played uh, high school ball with, he was two years older than me. He went to Golden West, and then he went on to UTEP, Texas, El Paso. So here's what happens. He comes back. He visits. John, we need a long snapper. Can you still do it? <laughs> yeah, dude, totally. So I, I, I go, and I, I get the film from Golden West Junior College that season. And I was like, okay, cool. I start putting my highlight tape together, right? And I, and I had some highlights. I was a good player. Okay. But I didn't have any, I didn't have any snapping because I didn't snap. So I was like, well, well what the heck? Tim Thurman, 6'6", six, six, long snapper, he's better than than I probably ever was in my entire career. I'll just take some of his film and just say it's me, and then it doesn't matter because I can do it. I just don't have film doing it. So I'll just I'll put his high, I'll put his highlights on there and say it's me. This is this so, is so wrong, but I mean it worked well, out. So this is good. You yeah. used somebody else's highlights yeah. to get you a job, and ultimately got into the pros. But, but at the time, I did not feel like I was being deceitful because I knew I was good enough. Like I could watch okay. the film. I knew I knew I could do it. I just needed the opportunity. Well, they so say in my mind, mind it's, it's not a lie if you believe it. That's right. Don't let the what is it? Don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> so I worked a few months. I really honed the skill, and then all of a sudden I went in as a true sophomore, and I was I got a full ride to be the starting long snapper. So here's what happens my senior year. I'll never forget. Gary Nord comes in and Nate, Nate Poss and and kind of the, the coaching staff, and they go, Hey, John, there's interest in you playing in the NFL. And so in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to be an NFL linebacker, like linebacker, like junior say, hell, watch out. Here I come. Right. Okay. And they're like, they're like to be a long snapper. And I was like, whoa, talk to me. And I'm like, so what does that mean? He, I'll never forget this. The coach goes, well, I mean, if I were you, that's what I would do. We got an all American freshman linebacker. Who's amazing. So we're, we're good at linebacker. So why don't you just snap your senior year, which means less meetings, uh, less hitting, I guess, less practice and a better chance to go to the NFL. Holy cow. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that gig. You're like the walking Instagram page of all those different well, quotes and things that you're supposed to put out there. Like, if you don't know how to do something, say yes and then learn. I truly believed it. Now, here's one of the best stories that I, I, I wrote a book um, and it's in here and it's a great story. So I uh, was misdiagnosed with a, a bilateral inguinal hernia at the end of my senior year, which means I had two hernias. And it can be misdiagnosed, not because of the doctor, just the internal swelling exceeds a certain point. And so therefore it's, it's hard to detect, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I did cortisone shots in the tendons in my groin. It was so painful because we didn't really know what it was and the pro day's coming up. And now get this, I have to run a 40 yard dash. At the time of that pro day, I could barely walk. I'm not making this up. I could not speed walk. It hurts so bad. All the scouts are in the, in the bleachers. I'm getting ready to run my 40. I can barely walk. 
So I, I think our, our trainer must have told the scout, because this is all I know. The scout got on the megaphone and said, Dorn boss, why are you running? Um, I was told I got to run a 40 yard dash, sir. You are not fast, nor do we care. Why don't you go warm up and, and get ready to snap? I don't got to run a 40. No, we don't care. You are not going to make this league because your speed go warm up and snap. So I said, holy cow. So I think one of the things I'm most proud of is I made the NFL and I kid you not, I am not making this up. I have never been timed in a 40 yard day. Welcome back to the pulse so much in John Dorenbos's life that he still has to share. So let's keep the conversation going. We started off with the challenges and we'll talk about some of the challenges because your book and your tour and everything is about overcoming those challenges. Challenges aside, you have kind of lived a charmed life in those types of situations. So somebody Man. else's highlights got you to the college team. You didn't have to run the 40 and made it to the NFL and didn't just make it to the NFL, had an all pro, what, 14 year career in the NFL Two time. in a position Two time. that you didn't want to do. Two time pro bowler. I'm sorry. One Two time, time pro bowler. <laughs> Super Bowl ring, Ed Block Courage Award winner, Walter Payton Man of the Year. Come on, baby! And like most it. consecutive games, no, hey, most consecutive games played in Philadelphia Eagles history, which I'm really, really proud of. So at one point, you were playing football, successful in football, and competing in like America's Got Talent and doing magic. There was a moment when I was doing playing in the NFL and did America's Got Talent that I was doing both careers at the highest possible platforms, the NFL and the number one TV show in the world. Uh, and doing magic simultaneously, both careers that a lot of people said, you're never going to make it, kid. Like, that's why would you want to do that? A lot of people don't realize this. I did training camp. It's in Philly, and the show was being filmed. The previous year, it was in New York. That would have been so easy, right? But now it was filmed in L.A. So I had multiple days in training camp that it was 8 a.m. meetings. I went to training camp till 5, okay? Uh, rushed over to the airport to get on the 6.15 to L.A. So I would fly from Philly to L.A. I would land. I would have like two or three hours to do interview, B-roll, camera blocking, rehearsal, to then be on, be in the air by 10, 1030, to get back to Philly by 715, to rush over uh, with an escort to get to my eight o'clock meeting. And then I would go till five and then go to the airport, then fly to LA a couple hours, then fly back, training camp, and go back and forth. We're playing at the highest level and performing at the highest level. So doing yep. all of that and what, third place in America's got I got now? third. Yeah, I got third. You end up leaving our Eagles. We're going to push that aside for a second and, and ignore their awful decision, Eagles fans. Um, traded to the Saints. And then, then, what was it, the physical that showed that you had a very serious issue? So what happens is they trade me. Uh, they heard a murmur in the wrong place, and they were like, we're going to have you go down and get an echo. And I did. I got ready for practice, and I came back from the hospital. and said, hey, we're going to go do more tests on you. Okay, come back again, get ready for practice. And then they said, I got a phone call and it said, hey, you're never playing football ever again. Uh, at the time, I was 37, signed a three-year extension for millions, more mm -hmm. money than I'd ever seen, right? Uh, people were calling me pops. I was playing with Drew Brees. I was on a team that wanted me. It was, a, it was just, I was going to be endorsed 13 games. Are you kidding me? Like, get me out of the Northeast at my age. Great. All black uniforms, slimming. I still wear all black, slimming <laughs> for, for an aging, pudgy guy. So, all positives. Um, all positive, right? Uh, and they said, you're never playing football ever again, and you're going to be in emergency open heart surgery in the next 48 hours. Is it an overstatement to say that that trade potentially saved your life? Like this, this was a life threatening thing that they found in this physical. Uh, I would say that it is a, a hundred percent that that trade saved my life. So the vein that leaves your heart uh, is, is called an aorta or a vein, a layman's term. And right where it hits the heart, that, that thing that's supposed to be the size of a dime or a nickel, it started blowing up like a water balloon. And my part of where the vein hits the heart got to be the size of a soda can. So it should have been this big. And mine was that big. Wow. If that pop, if that pops like a water balloon, uh, you're, you're, it's, it's two or three seconds of the worst pain ever. And then you could be on a surgery, a table in surgery. If that ruptures, you're, you're dead. There's no coming back. Jeez. And so that's, yeah, I was one hit. Welcome back to the pulse today. Our guest, former professional football player, performer, motivational speaker, John Doran boss. Let's keep the conversation going. So the football career is over, but you were healthy. Um, but the, the touring, the magic, the performance, you're still doing that. Is that the thing that you get the joy from now? Like what's bringing you joy at this moment? That I had a life after football, that I wasn't worried about figuring out how I was gonna make it because I had something that made me happy, I had purpose. And that was performing and speaking. 
and it's something I love to do. When when you take that pressure away, I played football because I loved it. I, I absolutely get you doing the motivational speaking and, and talking to people because you've overcome so much that you continue on and people see your story and like, huh, if you can overcome all of that and achieve that level of success. So here we are today, and I want to talk about, you got a, you got a, a book that's going to be turned into a movie, uh, but John Dorenbos, no huge surprise that a fire breaks out in front of you. Ooh. You know, and that's, I mean, I guess it's something that, that we can kind of talk about. There's, there's nothing lighthearted about it, but the person's going to be okay, so that, that's a positive. Um, but how does, how does that happen? You My wife says we got a babysitter. Let's do adult things, which means let's sit on a patio and, and have dinner as adults. Right. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll put the groceries away. What, if there's a spot on the patio, we'll do it. The spot on the patio is open. So I go put the groceries away in the truck and I notice a, a, a big blanket. Huh. If mom's warm, right? If wife's warm and we're sitting on the patio, then dad gets to stay outside, which I'd rather be outside and be cold. So I bring her the blanket to keep happy wife, happy life, keep her warm. And then a few minutes later, my wife and I hear a scream that we both thought that there was a fight broke out or somebody had a gun. And so we both kind of stood up to just kind of assess the situation, make sure we're safe. And in about that two seconds that I stood up and turned around, I, the waitress, her apron went from on fire to her completely engulfed in flames. Mm. And what happened is her apron hit a little box heater that was on the ground that they had outside for their customers. So I look at my wife. Uh, I took my jacket off. I grabbed the blanket off her and just ran over to her. Uh, threw the blanket on her face to kind of keep because she her hair was on fire, but her face wasn't on fire. And so uh, tried to pat it, didn't get it. And then I, I guess I just completely tackled her, wrapped her around, rolled over on her and we got the fire out. Um, she just got released from the hospital. It's been about a month and a half. Uh, she had four or five surgeries, major skin graft surgeries. Uh, Veggielicious US is the Instagram. Uh, they posted all the pictures updating. You can see it, her recovery. They have a GoFundMe. Um, I didn't know these people. Uh, but people started coming out and said they're the nicest people in the world. And so people are helping them out. And obviously, they're going to have a lot of bills and the insurance covers a little bit. But um, I'm very proud to say that her face is OK. She is alive. She's a, she's a wife. She's a she's a, a mom. She's a friend. And she will she will live. There have been a lot of challenges and we've touched on some of them. Why are you sharing your story with people? What do you think they get from hearing your story? So let's let's say uh, uh, I'm with the Eagles and we're playing the Bengals. Well, a representative from Cincinnati would call and say, hey, we got these two kids and the mother killed the father. Hey, we've got these four kids. The father killed the mother. Hey, we've got these these three kids and the stepdad killed the mom, right? Would John come in and speak to these kids for a few hours on Saturday when you guys land? We'll bring him to the hotel. And so now on my away trips, I would sit in a hotel room with these kids. And I don't think anything felt better than to be the person in that moment, to be able to look at these kids and probably be the only person they'll ever meet that has been through it and is genuinely happy, regardless mm -hmm. of what you what you define success as, right? I'm happy. Yeah. And I would look at these kids and I'd spend hours with them and I'd say, I'd talk to them and we'd cry and we'd laugh and I'd, I'd tell them the things that I learned and, and I was it, it made me so proud to cry with them and say, hey, just don't don't ever not believe in yourself. And if you wanna cry, cry, you wanna laugh, laugh and just, do these things, keep with the process, and I promise you that one day you'll be happy. Life is magic, so it's out now. People can get a copy of the book. Uh, you're touring, so people can, here you go, hold that up. Product placement, you're touring. <laughs> so people can also see your, your performance and they may hear you speaking. So big name producers now have taken your story and are gonna turn it into a movie. Like, how's that feel? The first draft of the script is done and now they're going back and kind of just tweaking it. It's not a sports movie. It's it's a movie, uh, the most important thing about my life is that when you come see my show, I promise you, you're gonna laugh and you're gonna be inspired because it's my life story with the magic I learned along the way that got me out of bad situations to find happiness. And ultimately, it's, it's, it's a show, a journey and a story of how I ultimately, when my wife got pregnant with my daughter, I ultimately sat down with my dad 27 years 28 years after he killed my mom mm. and had the first conversation with my dad a month before I was about to be a dad. It is inspiring. Uh, and thank you for spending some time with us on The Pulse. Remember this, it doesn't matter what your situation is. Don't let it define it. The, the, don't let it define you. Let it refine you. Come to terms with your reality. Remember that forgiveness is for you. It's not for anybody else. It's not about winning and losing. It's about you coming to terms with what your situation is so that you can find happiness, so that you can make this world a better place. 
Wow. Thank you so much for watching The Pulse today. The discussion with John Dornboss, his life story, the things that he's been through. I'm so appreciative of him sharing it. I enjoyed it. I hope you did as well. And if you would like to hear more, the entire unedited edition, the whole discussion is available. The Pulse with Bill Anderson podcast, available any place where you get your podcast. So check it out. And we'll be back again same time next week.